Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to Jerry Friday. A little late today. Sorry about that, folks. But you're going to know where that time went. This show should be fun. I actually prepared a bit. Because there's something that I really care about that happens to me. I'm rather weak. Uh, Spider-Man. Boy, did I like Spider-Man. Spider-Man's my boyfriend. And like... Those that we love, I feel very protective of Spider-Man. So when friends of mine, people I would consider a friend, I think has a misguided opinion, I feel obliged to make them aware of it. Which is what I'll do in just a few minutes. Uh, I am going to uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Ryan Connolly's opinion of Spider-Man because I watched it and I was I was uh, I don't want to say angered by his opinion because I mean like, it, it's an opinion but it's, but it's wrong he has a wrong opinion he has an incorrect opinion he has a faulty opinion and uh, I'm going to talk about why it's wrong uh, because it's all in good fun except it's not because it's Spider-Man. Spider-Man, man. We had a great Spider-Man movie come out. Does everybody realize that? Does everybody realize that there is a great fucking Spider-Man movie in theaters right now? Because if you don't realize that, then you need to get on the train. I'm trying to think of a metaphor. You need to get on board to the train that takes you to the Spider-Man movie. I don't know why. Maybe people are building trains to the theaters now. Woo woo. That's what you should say as you get into your car. You should drive other people and say, I'm the conductor to Spider-Manville. Next stop, awesomeness. In fact, the projector should say that before he starts the movie. And he should wear a conductor's hat. And there should be a trolley car and a sleeper car. But not for Spider-Man, because you're not going to be sleeping, because it's hilarious and awesome and amazing. Um, you want let, let's, to, let's get right in it. Um, so there is a YouTube series put out by the Triune Film people, the family of, of well, sometimes literal family, sometimes metaphorical family that uh, operates now outside of Dallas, Texas, used to be down in South Florida, like uh, a fellow Floridian uh, expat, like I am now. It's called Variant, and it is usually hosted, and I'm going to butcher his last name because I'm a goddamn idiot, uh, Eris Quinones? I feel like that's close enough for government work. Uh, And it's great. It's amazing. Uh, He reviews comics, does comic book lists. It's great. You need to watch it. You absolutely need to check it out. But this week, they kind of took up the first part of the episode with him and Ryan reviewing Spider-Man. Now, normally what people do is they watch things on the internet and then maybe they comment later and they're like oh well i think you made a good point here i think you made a bad point here that's fine for other people but they don't have a friday show where they can spend an hour and a half they can get up at 5 30 in the morning write the blogs and then spend an hour and a half culling uh audio bites from that interview and then write a detailed counter review and then read it for you right now on Jury Friday, like I did. So you want to know what? Let's actually just get right into it. These are clips from the Variant Review. I'm going to post it in the chat room right now. You can actually watch the whole thing there, and everybody should. Everybody should go watch it, because it's, it's, it's a great show. And you can, watch, you can put in context the things that I'm taking out of context to, to rebut here. But let's just get it started. This is Ryan's overall opinion of Spider-Man. Oh, let's get the audio up. So, uh, overall thoughts? Um, I, I, was, I was disappointed by it. And I'm disappointed by you, Connolly. This is easily the best Spider-Man movie we've ever seen. And I actually don't think that he would disagree with that, because he hated 
the Raimi films. But I would say it's a top five superhero movie. I'd say it's a top... I mean, in a world right now where we don't know the relative quality of Dark Knight Rises, because it's not out yet at the time that I'm talking... I think you can make an argument that it's a top three superhero film, and I would like to see what other people put in there. I mean, you got to have one of the Batman films, even if you didn't like Batman Begins. You know, uh, Dark Knight, I feel like Dark Knight or Batman Begins has to go in your top three. I don't know what else would, would, would be there. I think it shuffles very, believe, you know, for heroes people like. But I think this is... This is a really strong, subtle movie. I mean, I think that this this story. Well, you want to here? Let's let, let's get into it because there's a, an issue that I think is is a major thing. All right. Well, this is uh, Ryan pitching about the origin. It's a, because pretty much everybody knows the origin, right? And I'll agree. I was shocked how taxing it actually was to sit through that origin again. Yes. It wasn't interesting. It wasn't drawing me in. I didn't care. It was like a job. <sighs> I mean, if your job was just getting massages and pina coladas and dancing in the streets, like the song says, like, that would be, yeah, no, it was like that job. It was like the pina coladas dancing in the streets job. That would be the kind of job that I would compare The Amazing Spider-Man to because it's awesome. All right. Amazing Spider-Man works for the same reason that Batman Begins worked, in my opinion. It's about Peter Parker and not Spider-Man in the same way that Batman was about Bruce Wayne and not the lunatic running around in the cape and cowl. In fact, and, and Batman plays on this way more than Spider-Man does, uh, there is an element of lunacy <laughs> to, to Bruce Wayne. And there is an, an element of mental instability that kind of goes along with uh, pressure and expectations in that particular story. In, in Spider-Man, it's different. He becomes Spider-Man for different reasons, but it's similar in that it's about that character's journey and specifically what that means, not only in terms of what Spider-Man as a idea means, but how that fits into his world and why it becomes part of his world. The introduction and evolution of Parker is the reason why the film succeeds, far more than the Raimi films. In the Raimi films, it's, it's, you know, a completely, you know, and this is, obviously there are elements of, of accidental reasons why he, you know, gets bitten by the spider, but he gets put in that position because of motivations and because of curiosities. And I don't think that can be discounted. I think that that grounds the character and, and to me, made me far more invested going forward, not only for this particular film, but also setting up the universe at large, for which, uh, I guess now, since the movie's made uh, a, a bunch of money, you know, they're setting up for a Batman, a Nolan-style trilogy. You can say that you don't like the doing the origin again, but there's not a lot wasted in it. I, I don't feel like there's doing these stations, I think io9 called it, these stations of the spider, you know, of <laughs> Oh, he's picked on at school, Uncle Ben, blah, blah, blah. You know, like all these things that happen in an origin story are gone through. They're all shuffled through. They're all there. But I don't feel like, I never felt like it was trudging. I never felt like it was, oh, God, why couldn't we do something else interesting? Everything's there for a reason. Specifically, there's a scene up top where uh, a basement, fl the basement floods at where in, Parker's house where he lives with uh, Aunt May and Uncle Ben. And it gives you a real-world example of, of two things. Number one, well, it gives you an example of one thing. How much Aunt May and Uncle Ben rely on how smart he is and what kind of an engineering mind he has. Uh, and, and, and not in a, like, like, oh, God, Parker, you got to fix this again, Peter. Like, it's in a, a, a subtle kind of relatable way. And this is also because uh, Martin Sheen is amazing. And I think Ryan says that the cast is great. Martin Sheen very specifically, and we'll get into that in a second. But then it also gets the mystery briefcase into play, uh, which sort of is our, our key, our Rosetta Stone to the what happened to my parents sort of mystery and, and works in Dr. Kurt Connors. 
Now, if you're going to hold the origin against this film, then there's no way to get around it. There's just no way. There's not a way that I can say or you can you can kind of work your way around like that you just didn't want this to be an origin story. And that's fine. And we'll get into why I don't think they should have just jumped into the Raimi universe again. Um but we've read Origins for Spider-Man uh, a million times, and that's something else we'll, we'll revisit. But let's get into another one of Ryan's gripes. This is uh, his take on the love story. You know, it's Mark Webb, who did 500 Days of Summer, and I feel like the movie was a mixture between Spider-Man and 500 Days of Summer, spending more time on that 500 Days of Summer, summer story with that love story between Gwen Stacy and... Okay. First off, Emma Stone's awesome. Emma Stone's amazing. And real quick, hold on. Somebody in there, somebody in the chat room, real quick. Uh, Hobbit from PA. There are six words that were left out of the movie that are part of the origin and have to be said and not alluded to. There are six words that are left out of the movie. Okay, so he repeats it twice. Number one, uh, Uncle Ben never says, with great power comes great responsibility in the Amazing Fantasy story. That's a, a subtitle, or not a subtitle thing. It's like a, a, a narrator note. It never comes out of Uncle Ben's mouth. So if your issue is, in the comic books, Uncle Ben says, I don't know why I'm giving you that voice. It's not Uncle Ben's mantra. It's written in the thing. It's written in the, the, the narrator thing. So, I mean, yeah, no, it's Peter Parker's mantra, but Uncle Ben's thing and so whatever so i mean my point is he doesn't specifically say that but uh, i don't know that didn't bother me as much if 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 that's what everybody's freaking out about let's get into the love story every interaction says something about the characters that comes into play later on gwen intervenes with flash thompson in a way that makes peter parker uncomfortable which mirrors her intervening in the final climactic scene at oscorp in a way that makes peter parker uncomfortable Specifically what I love about this film, and specifically where the love story, I think, is a great delivery method, is the duality of Spider-Man's and Peter Parker's burgeoning relationship with Gwen Stacy and his burgeoning relationship with Spider-Man. Understanding, becoming Spider-Man, what that means, and how he is going to do it. And it's something that I haven't seen in any other Spider-Man movie or a superhero movie, is just, I thought it had a very interesting take on the secret identity. Subtly, Peter's very cavalier, or at least more cavalier, with the idea of telling people close to him that he is Spider-Man. Now, he doesn't have a lot of people close to him, but Emma, or Emma Stone is the actress, Gwen Stacy is the character. Gwen Stacy is the newest person who is close to him. And there's, you know, specifically a moment on, on the rooftop where he finds it easier to kind of broach initial physical intimacy of kissing her, or he finds it easier to tell her that he's Spider-Man than it is to kiss her. And, and that, to me, puts things in a context and is an interesting way of, of, of dealing with it. And it was, again, it wasn't ham-handed. It wasn't like, like oh, I want to kiss you. Oh, I don't know. Oh, let me think. It was, it was well done. And to me, it was believable. To me, it was grounded. And to me, it gave weight to really unrealistic decisions because that's really the challenge of any kind of superhero movie is to give real-world weight to an unbelievable circumstance and scenario. And I thought that the love story was fantastic. Not to mention that as far as a Hollywood story goes where you're going to have good-looking, attractive people play all the roles, I thought this was the most realistic portrayal of two sciencey nerd people kind of falling in love. There's a lot of stammering. There's a lot of missed opportunities. There's a lot of foot shuffling on both sides. Uh, Emma Stone, Emma Stone's a gorgeous girl. She's super hot. And there have been films where she's played, she's super glammed up. This is not one of them. You know, she doesn't look ugly, but she's you know, kind of bony, you know, looks like a girl that would spend a lot of time in a science lab, more so than, you know, a bombshell vixen. We don't get the, uh, and granted, Mary Jane was a different character than Gwen Stacy, but like we don't get the 
wet t-shirt in in the rain you know she doesn't look as vivacious as kirsten dunst did in in the rainy films she's like a a, i think i'm not a woman uh but i would say she seems to be a slightly more relatable character i think to women and i know i watched that movie and said i know more chicks like that than i know chicks like Dunst's Mary Jane. I thought she was fantastic. And to me, the love story was what made the film. Uh, You know, Ryan takes uh, 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 exception to the fact that there's an hour stretch before we get him in the suit, before we get Parker in in the Spider-Man suit. And to me, when I realized that, which there's a very specific point in which you kind of realize, oh, wait, he's not Spider-Man yet which comes later in the film, that I was willing to go go do a rest of the movie where he doesn't become Spider-Man. I was really locked in to to the love story. And I love them. I love Gwen and Peter, and I wish Ryan would stop talking ill about them. But you want to know what? Let's get into the script. Things that weren't good, I thought the script was not very good. I mean, the concepts that were in there were great, and I would have yeah. loved to see develop more, but it wasn't. It was just chucked at you. And I'm like, what, how did we get here? Why didn't you spend more time <laughs> getting us here? Mm-hmm. I would have been so invested. All right. I have a hard time separating the cast was great from the script is great, because I feel like a lot of the moments, although the cast is fantastic and incredibly well uh, placed in each role, I don't think that you can just kind of separate the two because a lot of the moments are the actors are put in those positions because I believe the script is very, very good. Specifically Uncle Ben. This is an Uncle Ben unlike we've ever seen, certainly in the movies and many times in the comics. Usually Uncle Ben is an old man prop. He's a ventriloquist dummy. He's a Teddy Ruxpin. He's an old man Teddy Ruxpin who they roll out and they pull his string and he says, great power comes great responsibility. Whoa! And then dies. And then, you know, Peter Parker falls on his knees and says, I'll go Ben! And this is in every Spider-Man origin ever. You don't really get a grounded relationship between Parker and Uncle Ben. And this is not a story like that. There's a reason why we spend an hour as we spend an hour with Parker before we get to Spider-Man because these are the foundations that kind of make his entire transformation far more believable and there is no better example of this than Martin Sheen's Uncle Ben which I feel like the lines he has and they're fantastically delivered and it's easy to just say, well, we care about him because he's a great actor. But I don't think that's the case. I think you could have put in a worse actor with that same script, and it would have been a, you know, not as good of a movie, but an 80% as good of, of a film because you have all that information in there already. In terms of the Spider-Man evolution, each action set piece means something. And... The action set pieces are kind of used as proving grounds for the ideas that Parker is exploring as, you know, when he's not in the suit. But he there's there's kind of a a scientific hypothesis, you know, sort of situation in action for me watching the film as he kind of narrows down exactly what he wants to be. Each time he goes out, it's not just an action set piece of like, well, now we're going to have him run around and do this. Each time he's out there, there's there's a reason for it, and each conversation he has about Spider-Man as an idea, he was changed, which I think is the sign of a well-written script. He has, uh, you know, there's a scene in the trailer where he's having a conversation with Captain Stacy, Dennis Leary's Captain Stacy, and he comes away from that, I mean, in the trailer it kind of plays off as very antagonistic, uh, very, you know, guess who's coming to dinner, uh, what are you doing with my daughter kind of thing. But in in the film, he is evolved by that. And his relationship with Captain Stacy is something that complicates what he thinks his idea of Spider-Man is, which is constantly changing. You can say you weren't engrossed by the story, and that's fine. But I don't think it was spinning its wheels. And I think that that is something that you can't really argue about, is that if you look at scene by scene, what's at stake, how do the characters change, there's kind of a constant movement. And I think a lot of it's subtle. A lot of it is way more subtle than we normally see 
I mean, certainly normally seen in a Spider-Man movie and normally seen superhero movies in general. But there's a reason why I think the longer I get away from this film, the more I think about it and the more I kind of appreciate it. But if it were up to Ryan, we wouldn't even get this film. Let's see, why did we need to reboot this story? I have a okay. love-hate relationship with this movie. Right. And I think, like you said, I don't think we needed this reboot. I think we should have just jumped right back into the property. Just have all new people take over and jump smack dab in the middle. Okay. So what we should have done is we should have stuck Webb with organic web shooters or with the Green Goblin, Doc Ock, Venom, Sandman, and half a Hobgoblin story completely off the table. Or he has to do a ham-fisted, well, no, but they're not dead. Or in the universe where the symbiote makes you want to dance. Which, if you hate... The previous films, or let's just say Spider-Man 3, why do we want to put him in the same universe? I don't get that. Spider-Man has been rebooted a billion different ways. Many times very conventionally, many times not. Let's just go ahead and take a look at Spider-Man's uh, alternate versions of Spider-Man. Ultimate Spider-Man, Earth 691, Spider-Man Newspaper Strip, MC2, House of M, Spider-Man Marvel Adventures, Spectacular Spider-Man Magazine, Spider-Man 2099, 1602, Elseworlds, uh, Algamin Comics, Exiles, Earth X, Age of Apocalypse, What If AOA, Spider-Man Chapter 1, Pestilence, Mutant X, What If, Spider-Man Powerless, Spider-Man Rain, Marvel Zombies, Earth Z, Bullet Point, Spider-Man India, Spider-Man Noir, Spider-Man Logan, or Sp Wolverine, Old Man Logan, Marvel Nemesis, Rise of the Imperfect, Spider-Man Unlimited, X-Men Forever, Adam Warlock. It's been done a million times. You know, we reboot the Spider-Man story in some fashion, either by movies, cartoons, comics, once a year at the very least. What's the... Why now? Why for this story? And, and, and I am biased because I think it's a very good origin story, but why are we against the idea of a film reboot if we want to give the creator the biggest palette to paint on and to really tell the story that he wants to tell. I, I, I don't feel like this is taking away from anything. I, I feel like, if anything, it's giving us what we all want. We all want Spider-Man stories. We all want more of the characters that we've grown up to know and love. We all want more of the themes. We all want more of the concepts that we've been fascinated by forever. So to say that we don't want this origin story just seems very, very strange to me. Why don't we have time for one more, specifically a great one? Now, why did I just spend the last 20 minutes yelling about this review? Why am I so hard on Ryan? I'm hard on Ryan because he's the reviewer the internet deserves. Not the one it needs right now. So I'll troll him because he can take it. Because he's not our review, he's he's not our reviewer. He's a silent guardian, a watchful protector, a dark knight. I'll be back in a second. We'll do the rest of Jerry Friday. I'll be right back. Welcome back to Jerry Friday. Uh, okay, real quick postscript. I saw in in the chat room, P. Del Henty was. Uh, was very and I was by the way I wasn't looking at the chat room while I was I was doing that because I, I had very specific bullet points that I, I knew if I wanted to talk about this film I wanted to not just ramble. So P. Delahanty uh, says that I, I mischaracterized what Ryan said that he really was not saying that it should be set in the same universe but he should just not tell an origin story and just jump into the fun stuff. I don't know if you can totally separate it because if you don't reset the story. Well, here, let me back this up. If Mark Webb wants to tell an origin story, I don't think that we should say he can't. That's just what he wants to do. Uh, I think it's the same reason why we shouldn't have said that Nolan needs to just tell a Batman story in the middle of Batman being Batman. If he wants to tell an origin story and he feels like that's important to the larger Spider-Man story that he wants to tell, then he should be able to start with it. I, I just I don't know. Number one, it's, it's 11 years between the first Spider-Man and, and, and the other, and the, this Spider-Man, the Amazing Spider-Man. And a lot's happened. I mean, this is not the same world that the first Raimi film was, was set in. You know, famously so, that, that, that film was shot pre-9-11. You know, they had to take away that, that teaser trailer where the helicopter got stuck in the middle of the two towers. So, 
I think that there's there's a very different it's it's a different world. And if he wants to tell the origin story, that's fine. Now, if he didn't want to tell an origin story, I think that there would be some baggage. That now, if you bring back villains that were in the original Raimi trilogy, that you would have to, on some level, deal with it because this isn't completely its own story. So, that's my postscript there. Let's get into the summer movie series, and we'll talk a little bit more about Spider-Man in more positive ways, because Spider-Man might just win me this motherfucking draft. Big weekend for me. Ted continues to wildly overperform, uh, bringing in $79 million so far, the largest original R-rated comedy uh, ever in the history of R-rated comedies. Brave does very well. Again, it came in number one. That is $149 million and counting, but The Amazing Spider-Man, the largest Tuesday opening in history, $35 million. And, uh, you know, the... Uh, Right now, I don't know what that six days is going to be, but it hopefully will be a gigantic number. And really, here's what it comes down to. Here are the big chips that need to fall. If Ice Age does gigantic for me, I have a legitimate shot to win this thing. Tom is counting on Total Recall. Total Recall is his... That's, that's what's going to win him the draft. If Total Recall is a hit, it's all over. If Colin Farrell and Jessica Biel and Brian Cranston can put together a good Total Recall remake, this is over. It's curtains. It's done. Tom wins. Of course, the big... Listen, he's, he's, he's lurking. He's a lurker. And Sarah Lane rises on the 20th. If Dark Knight Rises just makes a kajillion dollars, if Dark Knight Rises is the number one film in history, which, I mean, it's got a shot. If, if Dark Knight Rises is good, I mean, this could be the, you know, this could be the number one film ever. It could do Avatar. It could do Titanic money. It's not crazy to think that. Now, if that happens, then Sarah wins. So, to me, there are three people that have a shot, and they, it is in this descending order. Tom has the inside track. Sarah probably has the second best shot, and I'm on the outside. But... It all depends on how well Spider-Man does, how much money, here, specifically, how much money Spider-Man can make before Batman comes out. That's it. That and Total Recall and how much Batman makes are the only things that really matter in this draft. Brian's already tapped out, so he's not going to get far beyond uh, $575 million. Veronica, Jesus, fuck. I don't even know what the fuck is going on with Veronica. I don't know if she can make fucking $300 million. And Sarah's got Dark Knight Rises, the campaign, and the Expendables. The campaign looks like it could be a serviceable comedy. We'll see how big of a draw Will Ferrell is. And the Expendables, too, uh, you know, I love it. I'm going to go see the Expendables, too. But we'll see. We'll see. It might be enough to put her over the top. But it looks like, like right now, the magic number's probably going to be around 700 to 725, which is oddly enough lower than it was last year. Last year was around $800 million that'll win you the, the summer movie draft. Remember, you can see all these stats at draft.nsfwshow.com. That's where I'm getting all this stuff, which is, of course, coded by the dark wizard, Dan Dirks. Um, P. Del Ante is is freaking out <laughs> that there's no way DKR will not beat Avengers. Tom has a better backup film than Sarah. Well, I mean, it's going to be hard to be the Avengers because the Avengers made a kajillion dollars. You know, uh, and the Avengers has 3D, which, by the way, if you've noticed that, that there's advertising for Spider-Man that is basically saying, like, we know you've seen shitty 3D movies, but go see our 3D movie because we've actually given a fuck about 3D and we're not just trying to bilk you for an extra $10. Have you guys seen those, those YouTube ads? That's like, it's the only film made for 3D. Uh, which is hilarious that that's a narrative that they have to talk about. Because like, if you're like me and you went to see Prometheus and you fucking could not go see it in 2D and you had to go see it in 3D and within five seconds after Homeboy does his fucking bullion cube impression into the river, uh, 
you know, they have like, they're going to a cave and like the, the 3D they use is putting a fucking cave wall over three fourths of your picture. And you're like, thank God we invented fucking 3D. So I could have a cave wall in my face, uh, obscuring the vision. Finally, I can just, I can, I can see movies as they were intended around a fucking cave wall. Fuck 3D. Jesus. Um, but Spider-Man, I actually want to go see. I never thought I would ever see. I never say the words. I want to go see that in 3D. But there are, there are, I'm, you know, it's it's not bullshit. I think that they really gave a fuck about doing this in 3D, about making not only unique and interesting 3D experiences, but also having elements of it be punchlines. And I don't mean necessarily. There's a few comedic punchlines that I saw it in 2D, but I can imagine you know, play well, play better in 3D, uh, but also uh, emotional or action beats and punchlines are kind of paid off in certain ways in, in 3D. Uh, and also Spider-Man just kind of gives you a great reason to do things like swinging and moving and going through things and up and under things. So uh, now, like we said before, Batman doesn't have 3D. Batman's got IMAX. IMAX costs extra money. And now... They, uh, you know, now that they're just fucking fraudulently putting IMAX on everything, you know, that's going to mean more because they can charge an extra ticket for you to go to the same fucking theater as you would go see three years ago. But now they call it IMAX because it's just a complete ripoff. When did that happen, by the way? When did, like, things that aren't really IMAX, could you just fucking call IMAX? And they just charge you an extra ten dollars. What kind of fucking graft is that? What kind of scam? What kind of music man esque fucking scheme uh, did people have to fucking pull? They'd just be like, "Oh no, it's IMAX now." It's like this is the same fucking theater I've been going to for five years, and now it's IMAX. Just fucking ridiculous, stupid. Uh, anyhow, all right. Well, you know that this edition of Jerry Friday has been very movie centric. I know we've talked a lot of politics lately. I wanted to kind of get away from that for this week. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I'm going to uh, go take care of uh, uh, other stuff, but hopefully you guys you guys liked it. We'll be back next week, and uh, and we'll talk about. Actually, you want to know what? Let's actually head over to the Teal Deer Reddit. Let's actually, you know, I can never fucking find it. Was it Teal Deer dot Reddit dot com? Somebody throw that link to me. Ah, Reddit R slash Teal Deer. For some reason, I thought maybe I'm just keep me misspelling deer. Um, man, I'll tell you what. I haven't talked in a lot of politics lately. Like all this shit is politics. <laughs> um. Okay. Well, let's let's take a look at this Ars Technica story. New passenger service to the moon for $100 million. This seems like a weird thing story. We should cover this on weird things. Uh, well, you know, here's... I, I just realized, like, I'm not going to just sit here and read this goddamn story like an idiot. Uh, but, but yeah, okay, everybody. Uh, Reddit.com slash, uh, slash R slash teal deer. Like, teal as in the color, deer as in the animal. Um... You know, that's where we're going to be working at it from, from here on out. So uh, I'm, I'm going to be checking it. We can all talk and, and continue this conversation throughout the week, and then we'll, we'll discuss everything on, on Fridays. So, uh, so yeah, tealdeer.reddit.com. That would probably be the way to, to roll with it. So, um, you know, we'll check that out. We'll, we'll hang out. We'll hang out there. I'm gonna spend. Uh, I'm gonna spend more time there. This is like it's just one of those things that's got a switch in my brain. It's like I, I just would go to when Game On was going. I would just go to the Game On Reddit. For some reason, I just don't. Like I can't get into Reddit in general. Like I, I've never been able to find a community. So 
I just think the best way is just to create a community and just ask people to come and join me in my community. So that's what Teal Deer is going to be. It's just going to be us hanging out and talking about stories, and then we'll go over everything uh, on on this week uh, on on uh, Jury Friday. And we're getting closer. We're getting closer to doing the actual Teal Deer, Teal Deer podcast. I remember I was like before. Uh, You know, before and then uh, Ricardo Shinsky, Ricardo Shinsky, that's good. Uh, it says if only there was a Diamond Club subreddit. Uh, and and yes, I mean, I, I understand there is there is a a Diamond Club subreddit, but uh, Teal Deer was the idea for me doing a podcast where I would go over the week stories and uh, and do stuff. And I think that that's still gonna happen. We're getting closer. Because I'm, I'm trying to whittle down exactly what I want it to be. I just don't want to start it and have it be something that I don't like and then I won't do. So it's taken me a lot longer, especially with the move, to kind of whittle down exactly what I want. But here's what I think I want. I want this. I like this. I like the one mic thing. I like talking to you guys directly. I like the live stream element. I think that's going to be a large part of it. The other part that I like is just talking to my to, to friends, friends that are interesting, because I, I have no interest in booking people that I don't know. I feel like I just want to talk to people that I know and have conversations about things that I know I can have interesting conversations with in general. Like I can just call them on the phone and have an interesting conversation. So I think I kind of want to do that for, for this. And I also kind of want to make it a little, a little shinier. I want to gussy it up a little bit. I want to have like a theme song, maybe some, some transitions and stuff like that. So I'm working on those. That, that's all. That's all coming down the pike. Uh, but Teal Deer is where news stories can go. We'll talk about news stories. We'll vote them up. We'll vote them down. We'll comment on them. We'll yell. We'll scream. We'll call each other names. We'll fucking write an apology card to Ryan Connolly for yelling about his review. Uh, but I'll tell you what. Until next time, guys. My name is Justin Robert Young. And this has been Jury Friday. Until next week, please don't die.